I'm Caroline Wiseman, founder of The Art House on Albra Beach. It is a place for challenging and inspiring dialogue. And so we invited the distinguished theoretical psychologist Professor Nicholas Humphrey and the artist Rebecca Partridge to examine how art can be a vehicle for exploring consciousness. The audience of writers, thinkers and artists included the late Sagi Man, and they all joined in the rigorous debate. Here are a few highlights from this ongoing exploration. Are you all ready? Are you sitting comfortably? Yeah. Then I'll begin. Um, I'm Francis Carver, and I'm here to welcome you on behalf of Carolyn and myself to this house. And by the way, like tonight, the title of this is Seeing Time, Art as a Vehicle for Exploring Consciousness. So it sounds frightening. Right but anyway, the point is that we've got here Rebecca, who's been doing this exhibition in the tower, which you, some of you have seen, and she's going to talk about it. Is that right? And then Nicholas, who is a professor, a, psycho a psychologist based in Cambridge, but he's written a number of books about consciousness and the evolution of consciousness. Is that a fair description? Mm -hmm. what you've done? With a couple here, if anyone would like to look at them. And, uh, and so it's well, really into that sort of field. And um, what the idea is that they're going to talk, you're going to talk to begin with about what you've been doing in the tower, is yes. that right? And then Nicholas will launch some thoughts about it to get us all going. And then you're open to any sort of questions. And right? conversation between you. And we're yes, hoping between us and between all of us. And we hope everyone will join in, and I will try and moderate it, but not in a very positive <laughs> way. <laughs> but not in a very positive way. Well, first of all, I want to take the opportunity to thank Caroline for giving me a wonderful week in this uh, magical tower. Um, I think all of you have been in and seen the exhibition. So, to start on a very simple note, practically, I've got six paintings, and they are depictions, re responses to um, points in time in a 24-hour cycle. So it starts with 4am, and I was up at 4am watching the sea, true romantic, and then 8am, 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock, and then midnight. The, the basic idea for me is combining something quite reasonable and rational and um, human, like the marking of time, with a romantic, um, emotional um, experience of being in front of the sea. And I paint them in a very particular way. They kind of look like photographs, as you've seen. Um, I do that specifically because the, the photographic language is, it references a, a, an instant in time. We're used to looking at photographs and thinking that's, that's just now. And what I try and do is, it, is expand that moment in time, which is a nice reason that we can have this conversation today. Um, by the way that I make the image, so you read the image differently to a photograph because um, I hope what happens is this, um, the, the way that you look at a painting and the way that I've uh, used the brush marks, there's an empathetic, there's a kind of bodily response to looking at images in this way which slow you down. I have, this, I have a linear time and then I have the point in time. So I have this micro and the macro. and most of my works are always playing on these kind of priorities that like something internal or external or micro or micro big abstract things i think about them all as completely abstract um and on a, on a very abstract level I, the proposition is there's some, some kind of structure to our inner visual world that mirrors something on the outside and then the outside mirrors back into the inside so. i think what's really fascinating about the way you've approached your experience in the tower is this sense that you want to capture a moment, inst an instant. Mm. Um, and that's a very special thing to do. I mean, um, time doesn't consist of instants. Time, time, I mean, time just flows all the way through. And as soon as you um, say, you know, I'm going to make special this particular moment, as if it lasted for longer than it really did, mm -hmm. you're making a very important aesthetic statement, but also, you're, you're, I mean, Monet said that his whole effort was devoted to trying to capture instantaneity, mm -hmm. and that's why, rather parallel to you, he, he uh, created a series of paintings of haystacks or cliffs or the, the clock on the front of the Roman cathedral, um, every one of which was meant to say, this is a moment, but it's more than a moment. <coughs> Moments matter to us. Moments actually live beyond the, the actual uh, the point at which they were 
photograph or whatever it may be. And what's interested me is, I mean, I'm, I work on the philosophy and psychology of consciousness, and I'm concerned with two things which relate to art. One is how art can provide a, a way of illustrating what seems to be a central function of consciousness, and the other is in which you can find a metaphor at another level. I'll come to that in a moment. The first issue, though, is that again and again, when people try and talk about the quality of subjective conscious experience, they come back to this fact that conscious experience has this paradoxical quality. It seems to be about the preservation of a moment in time for longer than it really exists. If there's anything that's true about consciousness, it's that we live in the presence of what I've called thick time. Mm. Um, we don't live the world of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a clock or whatever it may be, which simply you know, marks, moves on from <coughs> inexorably from physical instant to physical instant. Every moment we live in is preserved and extended and gives us a space in which we live. Now, that's a very interesting uh, and a difficult idea to put across. And what painters, I think, have continually tried to do is to reflect exactly that point, that a moment isn't a moment, it's a whole world. Mm. Um, that we can, that mo moments have so a substance which actually um, we can, we, we need to try and capture. And it's central to our conception of, of we live in that present. I've used the analogy, I said it's like we, we move through time as in a, in a time ship which has both a front and a back and space in the middle to move around in. And I think, you know, it's very hard to, you know, that's a, that doesn't make sense in physical terms. But I think artists and poets and others in other media have tried to do is in a sense to give expression to that idea that the moment matters. The moment is, that's kind of in, in, a, a, a permanent significance which needs to be captured and expressed for all it's worth. And looking at your paintings just there, I see you like Turner, like Monet, um, you know, like, it's, it's, it's actually quite a, uh, that, that particular uh, idea is repeated again in the history of painting. Let's try and show how time is both progressing, but is actually consists of extended moments, which are <coughs> worth preserving because they, of the space in which we live. Okay. But just to be clear about this, because I think maybe this idea of thick time could still be a little bit confusing, there's two analogies that I would have. What, one would be, um, it's not really an analogy, but when I say a sentence, I'm, I'm very aware of the words that I've just said and the words that I'm going to say. Is it, is it something like that that you mean with thick no, time? No, I think, I, well, I think it's more... I mentioned to Francis like a harpsichord and you pull it out. No, I think it's, that's, that's a more traditional idea of what the extended present meant. And in a way, it's what painting in the past was largely about in a narrative painting. You would put into the painting clues to where it had come from, clues to where it was going, so that you could see this as a kind of drama playing out in time. I think that what Monet discovered and others after him, you're in that same tradition, is that no, this isn't to do with absorbing the past into the present or the future or taking account of the future. This is celebrating the moment. Mm. What we, what your paintings do is live in that moment. There's no, not in those look at in those mm. six paintings you've done like that. Nothing in any one of them predicts or or, yeah. Yeah. or, or yeah. reflects the past. It's simply saying, you know, this moment is real and important in its own right. And the reason why that ties in closely with some of my ideas about the consciousness why it matters to us, why it, what it, what, I mean, the way in which it actually comes into, into, in, 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 into our, our world is that every moment of consciousness is in fact a reverberating loop created in the brain which, um, which uh, so that every moment genuinely does hang on, it lives there for longer than it actually could do in physical time. And we move between these and paradoxically, these moments of extended time, which don't overlap, nor which nonetheless um, you know, feed each other. What do you call, I call thick time? And I've argued that in our sense of self, our sense of self 
is centered around that presence we feel, a presence which couldn't be delivered by pure, you know, uh, uh, physics as physical time as it's described as by, by, by mathematics or by, by physical science, but which psychologically is something which um, delivers a, a, a new dimension in which we can move out, in a sense, out of them. The, 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 the restraints of the physical world and enjoy and experience this moment of, of just of pure existence. I mean, as Mano said, I'm trying to present the most difficult thing to do, instantaneity, because we each all the time live in this moment. I mean, you know, what I think I'm doing is very much about the present moment, being in the present moment, and it's very much to do with sensation. And it's about, it's quite meditative really, it's about being in the body and, you know, being in the present moment and really, really looking at something and really paying attention to what's in front of you is um, uh, a very sensory experience, it's a very bodily experience and I think a uh, very important thing, it's a very difficult thing to do to be very in the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it would be a good idea for you just to summarise what you yeah. want about the whole evolution of consciousness, which is It's generally agreed among neuroscientists that there are lots of cognitive issues to do with consciousness about how we manage to bring together you know, thoughts and memories and perceptions and, and wishes and desires into a common workspace and then integrate them to make intelligent decisions and so on. That's it, you know, that has to do with consciousness. Sure, if, you, if, if that's what you're interested in. It's We're already beginning to see how that problem, of the cognitive problem, how to bring things together and make, uh, you know... So okay. cognitive means. So cognitive, I mean, I mean, just in terms of, of thoughts and, and, and decisions and so on. How to bring this all into a space in which they can be integrated so that an expert system, which is what self is can make the right decisions and act intelligently that's beginning to be it's called the easy problem of consciousness and it's beginning to be the, 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 uh, some good neuroscientific ideas out there they're going to get better almost all the leaders in the field realize that there's something missing from that which is why this life of the conscious life should actually feel like anything why it should actually be like something, in the phrase which is commonly used, to live in the presence of, of, these, um, of, of these... We all take it for granted. Yeah, we take it for granted, but it's in fact, I mean, in ways, it's a mystery. Mm. What, the, what is likeness of to live in the world? To, it centers around sensation. Sensation is not the peak of thought or cognition. In fact, Plato denigrated it down to the point of the lower levels which he wasn't interested in. But it's it's the level which actually relates us to to life, to substance, to ambition, to motivation. The it's something that animals don't have, you think. Animals do have it, absolutely do have it. They do. And that lower level of sensation, but we shouldn't call it a lower level, is actually the core of 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 what it means to 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 be a conscious being in the world. And that, the nature of sensation, the quality of what redness or saltiness or, or pain, at the moment has no explanation in terms of the physiology of the brain, let alone of some deeper uh, theory of the physics of it. Sensations seem to have quality which, which shouldn't exist. There's, no, there's nothing in physics or in physiology, which would ever have predicted that it would be like this to see red, or like this to feel pain, or like this to smell a rose. And do we um, know why that it would have been? Well, no, and that's the real problem. It's called now the hard problem of consciousness, mm. how that quality of experience comes into existence. Is this the problem of self-consciousness? No, and this isn't self-consciousness as such, it's just raw consciousness. What it's mm. like just to be alive and to the mere fact that we feel anything is it? Yeah. the mere fact that we feel anything yeah we feel anything at all and and we um, and so I and a good many others of course now are concentrating on trying to explain that dimension of conscious experience um, and I'm one of a few the majority are probably against us now who are saying that 
yes, we experience this. We experience the so-called qualia of sensation. That's a technical term, qualia, but you can guess what it means. It's a qualitative dimension of, of sensory experience. We believe and we, when we kind of experience these things as facts of the world, but in fact this is an illusion. Why are the majority against you? Because the majority of these days, it's probably how science is going, are going for so-called dualistic theories, that there is actually that there's some aspect of the physical world which underlies these qualitative experiences. I don't believe that. I think that the, these experiences, of course, are real for us, the experiences, but they're nonetheless an illusion. Um, there's something which we are creating as uh, our brains create something which we interpret as having these qualities which are in a sense unreal. They're not, the, not unimportant, but they're unreal. They don't actually relate to real facts about the physical. Using the word illusion is rhetorically a mistake. Nobody wants to believe that in an illusion. Mary Midgley has written a book called I the philosopher in Newcastle, I am not an illusion. Everybody finds it offensive to suggest that consciousness uh, is an illusion. And I've partly stimulated by discussions with Rebecca and others, realized there's another way to go with this. We're not, not an illusion, we're a work of art. <laughs> um, and everybody wants to be a work of art. Everybody will bind to that. When Daniel Dennett says, you know, Consciousness has been explained as an illusion. Everybody objects. <clears throat> if consciousness has been explained as a work of art, suddenly we see what he might be getting at. And I think actually it's an equally important and equally real way of looking at what's going on. What sensations have evolved to be is a take on information coming in from the world, which we transform artistically. Just to, that's the, you know, what is art if it's not it's not a copy of the world. It's a, it's a, it's a way of, it's an interpretation of transformation. I mean, Picasso said, you know, art and nature being different things cannot be the same things. Through art we express what nature is not. And I think, for reasons we can come to, the brain has discovered that by expressing what nature is not in a form which suddenly delivers a new sense of importance and significance to the things we're experiencing, it gives us a new lease on life. I said that I think one of the most important roles for art in relation to the philosophy of consciousness is to provide just that idea of what consciousness might be about. And artists have long been arguing and demonstrating that they can take in facts about the world and transform them in ways which then uh, open up new possibilities, new interpretations, new senses of significance in the world around us. It's just what Rebecca has been doing looking out the sea over there. I think it's what we've been doing certainly for the last 100 million, probably 500 million years. It's been taking in experience, transforming it within the brain, offering this up in the theatre of consciousness to ourselves as the appreciators of this magic show, though I'd now rather call it um, this art show, which has been put on for us. Throw it back into the world. The things which, the sensations which we discover in ourselves, we then place back into the world and so enchant the world around us, which gives us a new relationship with the world we're living in. <laughs>
motivation. The, something that animals 